Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the Master's Experience Series. Thank you very much for being early. We are expecting more people to join in, so we'll wait for a couple of seconds more before we begin. Now today is a very special day for all of us who are celebrating the Lunar New Year. It is the last day of the festival. So on behalf of everyone here at Headhunt, we would like to wish you a happy and harmonious Yuan Xiao Jie. With that, we will begin our session. Welcome to the Master's Experience Series brought to you by Headhunt in partnership with Yongpong House School of Law, SMU. My name's Tammy. Broadcasting live, we have with us Ivan, who will be opening the session and giving us an overview on SMU. Thereafter, we will have Professor Zhang Wei, who will share on the topic of blockchain and governance. Now, before I hand over the time to Ivan, please note that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to type in your questions at any time during the presentation. Please also note that we will be conducting our feedback poll at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'll now pass the time to Ivan. Ivan, over to you, please. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, allow me to share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining today's uh, Headhunt Master's Experience uh, with the uh, Singapore Management University's Yongfang Hao School of Law. My name is Ivan Lau, and I'm the Head of Marketing and Outreach for Postgraduate Programs at the University. And I'd like to start off with giving you a little bit of an introduction into SMU and talk a bit more about our postgraduate offerings. A premier university in Asia, the Singapore Management University is internationally recognized for its world-class research as well as distinguished teaching. Established in 2000, SMU's mission is to generate leading-edge research with global impact, as well as to produce broad-based creative and entrepreneurial leaders for the knowledge-based economy. Home to over 9,600 undergraduates, as well as 2,800 postgraduate students, SMU comprises six schools in the following disciplines of business, accounting, economics, computing and information systems, social sciences, as well as laws. SMU offers about 11 bachelor's and over 31 master's as well as PhD programs in the disciplinary areas associated with the six schools, as well as in the interdisciplinary combination of these areas. Our master's programs are globally recognized, employ an interactive pedagogy taught by our renowned faculty, boasts an innovative curriculum that is current, up-to-date, and real-world, and at SMU, you will also have access to unparalleled networking and career opportunities. And all this happens at our city campus, which is centrally located, nestled within the Arts and Heritage Precinct, right next to the Central Business District. Most postgraduate programs that we know of are either broad-based in nature, providing you with the ability to work across many areas, or are deep in nature, usually in specific disciplines, allowing you to gain expertise in specific functional areas. At SMU, the broad-based programs that we currently have are the Executive MBA program, the MBA, as well as the Master of Science in Management. And those that are more specialized and specific includes the rest of the others. And allow me to take a little bit of time to just go through some of these programs that we have on offer. We have the finance suite of programs over here, uh, the applied finance, wealth management, as well as quantitative finance. Each uh, type of finance program specializes in certain specific areas of in the financial industry. Um, and then there are the specialized master's programs which will focus in communication management for our MCM, master of human capital leadership in human resource management, as well as an, in a Master of Science in Innovation is in innovation itself. So these are business programs that are housed under the business school. We have then going to the right side, the Master of Information and Technology in Business. This is our flagship IT program, which allows you to specialize in four different tracks within the MITB program, namely analytics, fintech, um, artificial intelligence, as well as digital transformation. The ones in red 
are actually our accounting programs. We have both the Master of Professional Accounting and the Master of Science in Accounting Data Analytics. The former would actually be for someone who wants to obtain a professional qualification in accounting, but otherwise does not have the background to do so. The Master of Science in Accounting Data Analytics is more suited for professionals in, already in the industry who want to be able to leverage on data analytics in the domain. And next, we have the Master of Science in Economics as well as Master of Science in Financial Economics programs, uh, which actually focuses obviously in the field of economics. Um, and these offers use multiple tracks to choose from as well. And last but not least today, we'll be focusing on our Juris Doctor program and our Master of Laws. So that will be covered later on in the information session. Another way of actually looking at the program would be whether the programs are pre-experienced or post-experienced. And that's what this means is those on the left-hand side on the pre-experienced programs uh, accept candidates who have little or uh, less than two years of working experience to enter and enroll into the program. And those um, on the right hand side are our post experience programs, which give you, um, which are actually meant for those with some level of working experience um, to be enrolled into the program. So there are a few ways of looking at, uh, you know, which programs are more suitable for you. With that, um, I'd like to kind of introduce our speakers for today. Today, we have with us uh, Professor Zhang Wei, who is our masterclass speaker. Professor Zhang is the Associate Professor for Law and as well as the Associate Dean for Postgraduate Curriculum Teaching and International Relations at the Yongfa Kang School of Law. Uh, Professor Zhang um, has a PhD from UC Berkeley in Jurisprudence and Social Policy, as well as an uh, LLM from Harvard Law School. And after which, uh, we will be actually going into the information session with uh, Tsing Hao, Kong Tsing Hao, with, uh, who's the Postgraduate Marketing and recruitment, recruitment Manager for the School of Law. And without further ado, allow me to pass the time over to Prof Tang as he covers the masterclass on blockchain and governance. Prof Tang, please. Thank you, uh, Ivan. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Very clear. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this uh, um, introduction. And let me just uh, uh, start by sharing my slides uh, here. So as you can see, um, my name is John Wei. Uh, I am um, a uh, faculty at the Yongbang Hall School of Law at SMU. So today I'm going to share with you some of uh, you know the uh, you know I think the general more likely a general framework of the course one course I started to teach uh, actually uh, from last year it's a um, new course the title of the course is called the blockchain and governance so I don't know how many of you here uh, may have heard about a course with the same or somehow you know similar title. Uh, if you do, maybe you can just type in the chat box. So let me know, you know, uh, have you heard about similar courses elsewhere? I mean, um, uh, this is, as you can see, a course, uh, you know, the title of the course uh, shows, you know, with an N in between, it is a pretty much a, a cross-disciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary uh, course. As Ivan just shared with you, actually the interdisciplinary uh, education, especially at the postgraduate level, is kind of, a focus or so a kind of, you know, uh, I would say a distinctive, you know, feature of SMU's uh, PG uh, education. So here it is one, I think, one uh, example of that type of cross-disciplinary uh, education uh, available at SMU. So the blockchain, of course, is, I think, uh, uh, by now, uh, most people should be, you know, familiar with, you know, what a blockchain is. It uh, stands for a new type of the technology a uh, decentralized ledger system or whatever. I mean, maybe you heard about this. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, uh, basically a technological uh, issue. Whereas governance, governance certainly has, you know, um, uh, legal aspects. This is why, you know, I think the typical, one of the typical courses taught at law school is called corporate governance. 
right? because governance relies on law. There's no question about it. However, governance uh, has also other aspects, probably even more important, or you know, I, I think uh, those other aspects probably should go before, even before the legal aspects. Those are economic perspectives, as well as other social, even psychological you know, perspectives. So in this course, basically what we want to do is to put together the technological aspects of blockchain with certain you know, social economic as well as legal aspects to understand more profoundly what exactly the blockchain technology will bring us to, what might be the potentials of this technology and what might be something I actually we are actually overestimating about this new technology. So this course uh, is taught actually uh, by me and one of my colleagues from our computing and uh, uh, information system school, Professor Chu Fei Da. So uh, Professor Chu and I actually, uh, of course, we are colleagues for many years. Actually, we both uh, developed quite strong interest in blockchain uh, over the time. And we have some, uh, I would say, a quite constant uh, interactions and you know, exchanges about the blockchain. He certainly more from a you know, computer scientist, a, tech, a technical perspective, whereas me more as a, uh, you know, from a, you know, a lawyer and as well as a social scientist perspective. So we, uh, you know, after many, uh, you know, I think months, you know, discussion and preparation, I started to present this new course to um, the law students as well as other you know, students from other schools, post, mostly postgraduate students uh, at SMU from uh, last year. So uh, today, uh, Professor Chu, you know, will not be here, but uh, uh, I will just uh, quickly uh, share with you what uh, may be covered uh, by you know, Professor Chu uh, in this part of the course. So here is, as you can see, um, on the right hand side, there was a three layered, you know, a cake. I like this picture because I think it's uh, quite well, you know, uh, represents the general structure or the underlying you know, objectives of this course. So as you can see, our course, just like this cake is organized, you know, based on these three layers. The very bottom, the very basic layer is basically the technological side of the blockchain. So this is mainly you know, the foundation to be laid uh, in this course by Professor Chu as a computer scientist. So he will show the students, explain to the students in a non-technological way what exactly you know, the uh, blockchain technology is and how it works. So I think this is a, I think a, a crucial uh, precondition for us to talk about other things uh, you know, relating to the blockchain. If you don't know what exactly it is, what kind of you know, technology is supporting uh, this you know, blockchain and how you know, various functions uh, is achievable uh, through the technology, of course, it will be, you know, I think, quite groundless to consider the social economic as aspects of blockchain, as well as talking about uh, the legal regulatory you know, uh, aspects of blockchain. So that is the very foundation. I, I you know, think that's the lower you know, uh, layer and it's the largest and most, uh, I think it's the uh, very crucial part of this course. Uh, and then we have in the two, in, in the second layer, we have, I would say uh, uh, more kind of a, you know, exploration about the fundamental social economic implications or meanings of blockchain. So basically here we want to know from a social uh, economic perspective, what can this new technology bring to us? I, I believe you've heard various things you know, said about the blockchain, but here in this part, of course, we kind of try to provide a more systemic as well as a more kind of uh, um, uh, rational uh, you know, um, look at this new technology. So here we want to answer a central question, that is how may this new technology of blockchain change our world? What might be possible? What probably is not possible? 
Uh, so after you know uh, laying the foundations based on the foundations of these uh, previous two layers, then we come to the third layer at the top. Of course, you know I'm not I'm not talking about those candles. I'm, I'm talking about the the cake, and the third layer of the cake is more about the law, about the regulatory issues. I think that's uh, actually a quite natural logical development. If we want to talk about how the law and the regulators should regulate this blockchain uh, you know, technology so that we can uh, advance its positive aspects to make it you know, a work for the best of our uh, human welfare, then of course, those laws and regulations would not be possible until we understand how the blockchain works, that is the technological aspect, as well as what exactly the social, you know, economic kind of changes this new technology may bring to us. Because those changes may be positive, may be negative, right? So until we understand, uh, have some good understanding of those aspects, it will be, I think, uh, you know, again, quite kind of baseless to talk about legal and regulatory issues. So that is why, uh, we try to organize this course, you know, in this kind of general structure. I call it a three layer, just like this cake. And overall, the approach of this course we will see is I use uh, some of you, if you can read like the uh, Chinese, the Mandarin, you can see I use the Chinese uh, idiom. Actually, that's uh, something uh, teaching from Confucius. It's called Huan Hu are teaching in English, it means to review the old in order to understand the new. So as a lawyer, we always see the world evolves instead of you know, uh, um, uh, conducting some discrete jumps. Of course, we say there are some uh, very big kind of changes to our society. However, after all, our society is built up, the development of society is built up step by step. So everything that new we see today, probably they are actually not completely new, completely and then oftentimes cannot actually be completely, you know, uh, dispatched from this, uh, you know, matched from the previous, uh, you know, experience, the previous kind of uh, 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 development uh, of our society. And this blockchain, I think, as I will, uh, you know, uh, show you just in a moment, we will quickly see is exactly that kind of thing. The blockchain technology, not only from the technological perspective, is built on many previous technologies, and that part probably I will not Refer to today, it basically, you know, uh, is what Professor Chu will uh, contribute to this course. But I will show you the issues the blockchain wants to tackle, wants to deal with, actually, are many of the, those are traditional issues. And in our traditional world, we have already some, I think, quite a lot of explorations of those issues. And based on these kind of previous knowledge, we can much better understand the potentials of this uh, blockchain in a more rational way. So next, uh, I will uh, uh, sort of give you the uh, more general framework of this the course. Of this course, of course, I'm, I'm talking about more, you know, about the uh, social economic as well as the legal perspectives. So in this part of the course, we'll cover basically five big topics. The first topic I'm going to cover is about economic foundation of the blockchain trust. So I guess many of you here may be uh, aware of the fact that when we are talking about the blockchain, fundamentally, uh, it brings to us a new type of trust. Uh, or maybe uh, you heard about uh, more specifically, it's called the decentralized trust. So in order to understand what kind of trust mechanism it builds uh, you know, uh, by the blockchain and brings to us, we need to go back a little bit to understand overall in our social, uh, in our human society, how we can create trust, how we can trust each other, how we can trust, especially the strangers. So here I will, you know, go through um, the various uh, forms of trust that has been, you know, developed in the human history. And I divide these different, uh, you know, uh, forms of trust into mainly three different categories, the, as you can see here, the informal, the semi-formal, as well as the formal sources of trust. And I will also show you the students that uh, actually these various forms of trust, they are 
oftentimes in the competitive you know, status, which against each other, right? So they compete for, you know, uh, you know the, tr the different sources of uh, trust compete uh, against each other to provide, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, the trust in child society and make our society you know, function, especially we'll pick out one uh, a particular source of, uh, you know, trust so that is uh, the government, the trust build on the government, the government trust. We'll see how unique this type of trust is, uh, you know, within all these various sources of trust. And from there, we talk about why we need another different source of trust, which is a technological, uh, technology based of blockchain uh, as a new source of, block, uh, of trust. So here we talk about how the blockchain can provide us trust. Essentially, it is as we will see it is as a semi formal source of trust. And it enables decentralization. So here, of course, we'll talk about from an you know, economic perspective, how this kind of decentralized system of trust is possible using some very basic game theoretical uh, kind of uh, the, uh, theoretical uh, uh, presentations. And in particular, we'll go down to the two you know, fundamental forms of trust building or consensus building using the blockchain, uh, the uh, proof of work versus the proof of stake. We will talk about what are their, you know, economic, social economic implications. How trustworthy each of these different types of, you know, consensus mechanism uh, we can, you know, uh, attribute to. And uh, uh, after that, we were also, you know, introduced to the students a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, some, you know, pointed out by some, you know, uh, researchers. It's called the blockchain trilemma, which basically means as uh, between accuracy, efficiency, and decentralization, these three types of features, actually the blockchain or actually any other uh, you know, technology can only achieve two, but not the three simultaneously. And from there, we will, of course, I think uh, provide that something, you know, I think uh, uh, this course, um, I think innovatively brought to uh, you know, uh, uh, this field, that is how to understand the efficiency, because I think uh, uh, many of you may heard about the complaints about inefficiency of blockchain. So here we want to you know, share with you how to look at efficiency from both a static and dynamic perspective. And probably here we want to highlight a little more about the dynamic uh, aspects of efficiency, which is usually uh, ignored uh, by people. So, um, the last part of this uh, topic actually is a very interesting, as I said, to review the old to understand the new, actually I will compare the blockchain to another uh, well-established, I would say, you know, quite long established decentralizing mechanism that is market. If we think about uh, decentralization, we cannot uh, you know, afford not to consider market. Market versus hierarchy actually is something has been explored very thoroughly by economists as well as uh, you know, social scientists in the past more than a century. So this area actually, we accumulated a lot of very important and profound knowledge, which actually uh, brings about already like three Nobel prizes. So build on these very profound and crucial theories, we can have a better understanding what exactly blockchain can achieve in this uh, decentralization uh, uh, you know, uh, aspect. Why you know, the market as another alternative you know, decentralizing mechanism uh, faces some barriers and hurdles. To what extent the blockchain as a new mechanism of decentralization can address, overcome these barriers and hurdles. Uh, that's the first uh, topic and the second topic um, you know, will be about the governance mechanisms of the blockchain. So here we again start from a very fundamental question. So what exactly is governance? We will compare the, compare, uh, the governance of blockchain again with a more traditional form of governance that is the corporate governance. So we will see actually no matter what kind of governance we're talking about, first and foremost, we need to understand what is the goal of governance. If the goal is not clear, of course, uh, all other things talked about, the design of governance is pretty much built on sand. 
And uh, then we will, uh, you know, go through some, you know, uh, uh, crucial, you know, issues or, you know, the uh, key issues we discuss in the traditional corporate governance literature. As you can see, one is the agency, so called the agency problem. The why agency problem will be an issue in the traditional corporate governance. To what extent it will be an issue in the blockchain governance. These are some, you know, uh, key uh, questions we want to explore in this part of the course. And also, we can see the traditional governance also concerns a lot about the suppression by the majority of the minority. And then um, another important aspect raised in the traditional literature is about the members of a community or members of a, a, a company actually, usually even if you give them the right to govern, they will lack the interest to govern or so-called the apathy of the members. So how to address these issues to what extent blockchain governance will face these similar issues. So as you can see from there, we are you know, a move into, moving into the blockchain world. Again, we want to make clear what is the goal when we talk about the governance of blockchain, what are the goals of the uh, blockchain governance from both the technical perspective as well as the moral social perspective, what we want the blockchain to achieve through uh, various the governance uh, mechanisms and what are the main tasks you know, uh, we need to fulfill when we try to govern the blockchain. And again, uh, after that, we will introduce like two, I think the basic modes of blockchain governance now we see in the, commu uh, in the blockchain community that is the online, you see it's more like uh, based on the algorithms, uh, based on the coding, based on the so-called like the governance tokens, this kind of uh, automated governance system versus a more like traditional human-based, you know, human relation, Based the kind of uh, uh, you know governance mechanism, the offline uh, you know uh, governance, and uh, uh, in particular, we will introduce a few very interesting you know uh, examples about these various mechanisms, governance mechanisms. For instance, you will look at the several forks, you know, especially the latest the London fork of Ethereum. We want to know how the governance you know happen and you know what are those kind of things happened during this decision making process and what might be the issues the problems um and based on these i think you know uh, in reflection uh, you know uh, reflection and introduction we try to tackle uh, several main issues in this uh, blockchain governance uh, regarding this uh, blockchain governance topic one thing is we need to you know after uh, you know looking into more details of the blockchain uh, community, we want to understand to what extent the blockchain is indeed, from the governance perspective, a central, sorry, a decentralized system. So in this regard, we will introduce in particular two very interesting case studies about, uh, you know, the things happen, has happened to uh, Bitcoin, the blockchain of the Bitcoin. And so we try to, you know, through these kind of, you know, uh, case studies, we try to answer as you can see, a few you know, very interesting questions. Who, if there's any, in the blockchain governance world is the agent? Who do they you know, represent? And is there also a similar concern about the minority suppression in the blockchain uh, world? And then um, I think uh, uh, for me, especially, I think I'm especially interested in uh, the issue of why the members of the blockchain community, various kind of uh, participants in the community will have, or do they actually have a different incentive from the traditional uh, members of corporate community, uh, which we see, and you know, actually uh, they are lacking of the incentive to govern. So in this new blockchain community, why, uh, anyone will bother to govern after all. And do we actually see anyone actually does, you know, uh, try to uh, govern? And if they do, then who are they? Why they're doing this? Uh, the third topic uh, I'm going to cover in the course is more about legal perspectives about uh, the tokenization and the regulation of token, uh, tokenization and uh, various crypto uh, tokens. So here I will present a very broad general framework to start with 
about basically it's built out why do we want to regulate various financial instruments? And I divide these kind of various, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial instruments, of course, I mean, this is not my own category. Uh, we see this, you know, all the time. For instance, there are securities, commodities, but there are, you know, uh, currencies, right? as well as, of course, if we add to the picture, there's also like normal consumption goods, which is usually outside the uh, you know uh, financial regulation uh, framework. So we want to see the various current legal and regulatory rules to deal with these various types of financial instruments. And we want to explain why the regulatory framework have, they present very different focuses when they, come, when they come to various different types of you know, financial instruments. I want to present a big picture by looking into the target of the regulations, looking into the main issues, the focus of these regulations, and also looking into the more specific legal devices used to regulate these various financial instruments. After a, this kind of thing, more, I think the more fundamental understanding of the financial regulation, then we can try to map map the new thing that we're talking about here, that is the crypto tokens, to that map. And to basically to see the various different types of tokens, as we all know, like as at least many of you know, nowadays we have different types of crypto tokens, so-called securities tokens, like uh, so-called, uh, you know, the um, utility tokens or governance tokens, or, you know, just a, bit, uh, a Bitcoin and ETH or something, we don't know how to put them where to put them, right? So we want to, you know, using the logic of more traditional, you know, uh, financial regulation, we want to see how those were, to what extent those logics will also apply, be applicable to these various new crypto tokens. Then we try to fit these various crypto tokens into that uh, general uh, map. Right? This is, I think, a very interesting, I think, uh, uh, you know, exercise uh, we will uh, uh, do together in this course. And in particular, I will emphasize, you know, in this course, the natures and the importance of the stable coins, because stable coin indeed has many different uh, unique features and maybe some unique potentials compared to other crypto tokens. So we'll spend a bit more time, uh, you know, on stable coins and try to understand uh, what's exactly the stable coins are from a social economic perspective. Therefore, again, build on those kind of understanding how and what should be a rational and reasonable way to regulate stable coins. Maybe you heard about various efforts have been conducted, especially in the US about this, uh, you know, uh, a stable coin regulation. President Biden, for instance, convenes a, a presidential committee specifically to study the implication of stable coins and how to regulate uh, these new kind of uh, crypto tokens. So we will just uh, uh, look into in some more detail into these kind of various issues. And uh, uh, finally, uh, in this part of the course, we'll talk about a very uh, important you know, business activity. That is the ICO's initial coin offering. Now we want is, uh, you know, uh, understands the regulatory framework uh, both in uh, the United States and also in Singapore to deal with the ICOs. And we want to make a comparison to see what might be the differences, what may be you know, the different focus on emphasis of the regulators in these two different jurisdictions. The reason why you know, I think the US regulation will loom quite large in this course is for one reason, I think uh, uh, many of these crypto, you know, uh, tokenization uh, are conducted with a very obvious intent for finance. And U.S. is the most active in the biggest financial market. This, you know, that is where the money comes. So we cannot, if you are serious about doing something, uh, you know, uh, in practice, we cannot afford to neglect the rules uh, uh, or the ecosystem in the uh, U.S. And second, of course, the U.S., the, especially its regulators, are probably the most active players in the regulatory uh, realm to, you know, tackle to address the various concerns 
emerging from this you know, blockchain and crypto uh, token you know, uh, industries. Uh, many other jurisdictions actually are looking at the US regulators. I think it's very likely that uh, what's happening in US today may spread out to the rest of the world in due course. So uh, the fourth topic uh, I'm going to cover in this course is called the, you know, the, uh, about the smart contracts and DeFi. Especially we'll look at the legal and economic aspects of the smart contracts and DeFi. And these are very closely linked so because uh, maybe many of you know that when you talk about DeFi, the smart contract is the underlying kind of conceptual framework or the infrastructure uh, for these various DeFi projects. So we'll start by looking at you know, the economic function of smart contracts. Actually, the smart contracts, again, is not something new. It has happened, I think, at least we can trace it back to the 1940s, the smart contract. But uh, what in the new era the smart contract can you know, uh, bring to us, especially we will start by looking at a very, I think, uh, uh, you know, um, big and perplexing issue uh, confronted by uh, our current kind of, uh, you know, both the academics as well as the entrepreneurs. That is so-called the hold up problem. We'll uh, explain to you what exactly is the hold up problem. The hold up problem actually basically uh, leads to the difficulty of using a more decentralized mechanism available to us now, that is the market I explained previously, right? And uh, um, because of the existence of the hold up problem, we have to rely on oftentimes more centralized hierarchical you know, structures instead of a more flattened out decentralized market network. So we want to see if that is something, you know, perplexing, you know, the traditional decentralizing mechanism in the market, then the new decentralizing mechanism, blockchain to what extent can address these, you know, issues through, of course, it's more specifically, you know, the small contract uh, interface. So um, another important, I think, often discussed, uh, you know, feature of the small contract is, is its self-enforceability. So here we talk about the pros and cons of self-enforceability. I'll start by introducing to the students some of the traditional, you know, designs of the ways that lawyers have developed in order to achieve self-enforceability of contracts without using some fancy technologies like smart con uh, uh, like you know a uh, blockchain and then i will also you know bring to you know the students i think something uh probably not so often uh you know paid attention to especially by scientists computer scientists or tech uh you know technicians that is why it's not always the case we want self-enforceability of contract so i will show you from a serious kind of examples why lawyers will deliberately put in some you know, breaks in the contracts to prevent self-enforceability. So basically those are you know, the cons of the self-enforceability. And we will also uh, discuss um, you know, beyond that, that might be some other you know, limitations in the small contracts, including both technological and social economic issues. And from there, we look at a particular type of, you know, a smart contract projects, the so-called very, I think now very hot uh, DeFi, you know, uh, projects. So we'll talk about, uh, uh, you know, look at, you know, what's the DeFi, the projects they're doing and compare their roles with, you know, more traditional roles played by the uh, financial intermediaries, the various financial intermediaries in our, uh, you know, traditional financial market. As you can see the brokers, dealers, investment providers, to what extent their roles are replaced by the DeFi projects. And to what extent DeFi actually can uh, add additional kind of functions uh, to the traditional uh, financial intermediaries. Um, and then uh, based on that kind of understanding, we're looking at how to regulate DeFi or is it feasible or desirable to regulate various DeFi projects as what we are doing uh, now to the various financial intermediaries. To what extent those DeFi projects will bring us the same risks uh, as those traditional financial intermediaries. Therefore, uh, the, you know, um, 
the current regulation should be applicable and to what extent there are some new risks generated by the DeFi projects, which uh, we are not so far haven't encountered in our financial uh, uh, intermediary you know, uh, market. Right? So then probably uh, there the new rule should be developed. Um, and uh, finally, this is uh, you know, another, I think interesting and important uh, point. Uh, so the DeFi itself involves uh, the governance issues. We talked about more generally the blockchain uh, governance issues. And here we will look at, take a more like specific look at uh, the governance issues in the DeFi. And uh, in particular, I will just explain, uh, you know, uh, I call it the puzzle of the governance tokens, what exactly those governance tokens are doing. So what is the ultimate incentive you know, generated by the governance tokens, especially in a DeFi uh, setting. Uh, and a uh, last but not least for this part, so we'll talk about another very new and very hot kind of uh, uh, area, that is the non fungible tokens. They are also actually, uh, you know, based on the smart con uh, contract interface. So we in particular want to take a little bit uh, deeper dive into the economics of uh, non-fungible tokens, we want to see what exactly the NFT can achieve. And also we want to understand the NFT from a more traditional legal perspective, especially from the property law perspective. So what exactly, you know, the NFT, um, you know, uh, is related to the traditional, you know, property law system uh, in, of course, in, uh, in the current legal system. Uh, and the last part of this course, the fifth topic is uh, the other way around because uh, previously we talked more about, you know, the governance of blockchain, the governance of blockchain, uh, especially uh, in relation to the DeFi project. In those uh, parts, we basically take insights from the traditional corporate governance literature, the corporate governance kind of uh, 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 studies, try to help us understand to what extent the uh, blockchain, you know, uh, uh, community can, uh, you know, and can borrow from, you know, those kind of corporate governance, uh, the wisdoms of uh, corporate governance. Here, we want to look from the opposite perspective. That is the new blockchain technology as a decentralized trust building mechanism. To what extent can we form our existing corporate governance systems? To what extent it can help us overcome some of the, uh, you know, very uh, sometimes funny issues uh, we are, you know, uh, facing now in the corporate corporate governance world. In particular, we'll look at uh, two, um, you know, corporate governance uh, methods. One is about basically about the shareholder voting. As you can see, I will uh, share with uh, uh, the students the main various you know uh, issues now we are you know uh, uh, facing in the shareholder voting systems right for instance you can see uh, how to determine who is uh, eligible to vote as a shareholder uh, you know the various errors uh, you know uh, that uh, we can encounter in the transmission of the uh, shareholder voting uh, instructions why those errors may uh, occur and uh, uh, to what extent we can rely on the voting results the tally of the votes after you know, the voting in the current system. And uh, also why sometimes uh, very interesting and oddly actually there are more votes than the shareholders, uh, the overvoting issues. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, in a related context, uh, uh, why there are more shareholders to claim sort of the uh, prices after the company is sold than the number of shareholders registered, you know, on the uh, corporate record. And finally, you know, we'll talk about another very interesting thing, how some shareholders, when they vote their, you know, votes, actually they don't care how they vote. Why they actually don't care? They will not care or even want the company to do worse when they vote, so-called the empty voting uh, issues. So uh, after explaining all these various voting issues that we want to see which of these things actually is potentially, can potentially be uh, you know, resolved using the blockchain technology, what actually cannot be you know, uh, affected by this, uh, will not be affected by this technology. And a second issue about the uh, corporate governance we're gonna uh, talk about, of course, is 
more about the agency, the traditional agency problems, in particular the so-called uh, the management misbehaviors. Uh, more specifically, we'll look at uh, uh, you know two types of uh, misbehaviors: the management cheating and the insider trading, insider trading issues. And we want to see, with the help of the new blockchain technology, to what extent we can avoid various kind of dishonest uh, behaviors, uh, you know, now conducted, uh, are being conducted by some uh, corporate manage, manage, uh, managers, as well as how to better regulate the, those, you know, corporate uh, managers, their tradings of the co uh, corporates in the securities, so that we can level uh, the playing field for the inside and outside investors. Okay, I think uh, these are basically uh, what will be covered uh, by me uh, in this course. As you can see, it's uh, pretty much, as I said, organized as I just, uh, uh, under this you know, general theme, as I said, when who are to, sing, uh, to review the, uh, the old in order to understand the new. So I actually try to connect you, uh, you know, between this new, very new blockchain technology with the existing, many of the existing issues and many of the existing solutions, you know, to these issues, you know, in our world. And based on these kind of comparison connection, we want to see have a more reasonable kind of uh, expectation, understanding about the potentials as well as the limitations of the blockchain uh, technology. Okay, that's all that I want to uh, share with you today. Thank you very much. So I guess the next is the um, Q and A session, right? If uh, uh, you have some questions, please type your questions into um, into uh, your Q and A uh, the box. So I see some questions. How do you think the metaverse will be governed? I think this is a very broad question. I can't, you know, say it in a few, I think maybe even, uh, you know, with a, a whole course, we need to develop a new course for it. Actually, I think uh, we uh, uh, do have some uh, colleagues who are interested in this area in particular and try to uh, develop some new courses to our students in, uh, in due course. Uh, the metaverse, I think, is a very new phenomenon. Again, I think uh, my general uh, way of thinking, as you can see from what I just uh, presented to you, Review the old to understand the new. Just like how we treat the blockchain, I think we should treat the metaverse in a similar way. We look at what exactly the metaverse tries to address. Whether these issues are existing in the, uh, you know, our current world, and to what extent those issues cannot be resolved by the traditional kind of legal or technological, you know, uh, tool. And then from there, we can see exactly how much value this new technology or whatever, you know, domain of metaverse can bring to our society. So I think uh, um, instead of answering your question, you know, the more you know, specific, uh, you know, what kind of um, rules we should develop again, I think it is a very reasonable uh, way to look at metaverse, just like what we look, how we look at treats the blockchain, using that a three layer kind of a scheme work. From go to the very bottom, look at the technology, understand technology, then look at what exactly is the social economic implications of this metaverse. And based on these two layers, then we can start to talk about the regulatory and legal issues. Okay, so the second question, how close are we to CBRC? You mean the CBDC tokens, right? Uh, and uh, uh, will this be a new currency? And the CBDC, we can think of it as, you know, the uh, government uh, issued crypto tokens, right, basically. So I think this is a very interesting question. I do have some, I, I don't think I have much you know, coverage about the CBDC in this course, but I do have some, both Professor Chu and me have some, uh, you know, thought about this. Uh, I think the CBDC actually can be quite promising uh, to promote uh, the small contracts, of course, I, I'm talking about the blockchain technology based for small contracts, which can probably very significantly advance the welfare of our society. But it may be achieved in a counterintuitive way. I think this is something I personally, you know, I have a view of. 
So many people will say the blockchain is pretty much built on a decentralized ideology of concept. But CBDC is right to the opposite. It's the centralized kind of infrastructure, right? But I think decentralized mechanisms probably cannot be completely divorced from more centralized kind of uh, you know, uh, infrastructure. If this decentralized mechanism really wants to function smoothly and uh, you know, uh, achieve its best potential. A very simple example will be the market. I will say it will be weird and odd to say the market can be divorced from fiat currencies. The fiat currency is a type of, of course, uh, infrastructure completely you know, created and monitored by the centralized government. Right, so I think nobody will claim that because we want to achieve the best potential of a decentralized mechanism of market, we should do away with you know, the fiat currency. The same thing can be said in the blockchain world. So in the world, what I see about this CBDC is pretty much uh, what the fiat currency uh, is doing currently uh, you know, for a decentralized market you know, uh, mechanism. Okay. So uh, next question, DAOs are becoming part of the DeFi area. Um, uh, uh, would you see the uh, proposition of uh, merging of traditional corporate governance and DAOs decentralized governance? So I think, again, I think I mentioned, uh, I will talk about DAO in the course um, as well, but I think uh, uh, the fundamental point is still this. So uh, no matter it's decentralized or you know, uh, uh, centralized governance, we want to address some uh, very uh, you know, fundamental issues. Is there an agent in this system? If there is an agent, no matter how you frame the system, DAO or whatever, we need to be concerned about the misbehavior of, of agents. So that's the number one question. Number two, is there likely a majority versus minority scenario? If there is, again, we cannot afford not to consider how to protect the minority from the majority. Third, uh, we need to consider where exactly those kind of governance incentives come from. Especially this uh, issue is especially important in a decentralized system or any community which claims to be decentralized because of the very traditional you know, issue raised in you know, studied by economists for many, many years, so-called the, uh, uh, the collective action issues. Right? So we want to understand these specific issues in relation to, you know, we understand these things, you know, we have some understanding about these things in the traditional corporate governance world. Then we want to look at the DAO world, the decentralized uh, world, to what extent these issues are still issues. If they still are, of course, we need to still need to tackle them. If they are not, of course, that's good. Then probably we don't need to, you know, uh, use the similar rules as we do to uh, the corporate governance. Right, so, um, and then what's the next? I understand token governance such as in DAO are meant to uh, corporate equity and address issues based on traditional governance such as the agent. Do you see existing regulations governing such governance issues will be similar made for token governance? For example, fiduciary duties. So this is a very interesting question. Actually, I cover it uh, in particular, we'll cover it in particular in my course. So this starts from the question, do we have a fiduciary? in this uh, blockchain world? I think this question probably cannot be answered in abstract. It needs to be you know, answered in relation to each and every particular blockchain project to see to what extent there may be somebody actually serving as the agent. If there's an agent from there, we maybe we'll see uh, the fiduciary issues coming up. However, if it's indeed for some projects, as I was, I would say, you know, for some projects, I do see a completely decentralized infrastructure or more likely to be close to a completely decentralized infrastructure. In that kind of context, it will be weird to talk about fiduciary duties in the first place if you don't have a fiduciary to start with. Uh, what's the next? Is an, uh, an anonymity an essential part of the decentralized culture? How possible? Actually, this is not. The quick answer is not. And the blockchain uh, itself is not uh, anonymous. I mean, uh, some recent uh, events uh, uh, pretty well uh, illustrate this uh, uh, issue. Maybe you know the uh, US FBI recovered, I think, billions of dollars worth of Bitcoins 
uh, pre I think stolen many years, right, from some, uh, uh, you know, uh, those kind of blockchain uh, projects. And that exactly shows us actually, if it's completely anonymous, it's impossible for the FBI to do that actually. Blockchain, the Bitcoin at least I'm talking about blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain actually providing a better kind of traceability. It's uh, again, sometimes we have some misunderstandings about how these things, of course, um, this uh, involves more technical issues. I think Professor Chu, my colleague, will spend uh, uh, you know, uh, more time explaining these uh, technical aspects. So uh, what's next to be blockchain basically in more on decentralized ledger be gates of fork. Can we push more traditional organization about the blockchain and, or rather change their mode of structure? Um, I mean, uh, there might be some typos here. So I understand your question as do we need to, you know, uh, to what extent uh, revol reform the blockchain, uh, sorry, that uh, governance of the traditional organizations uh, by pushing them to use, um, you know, the blockchain uh, <coughs> uh, technology. Uh, this is actually something I touched on uh, in the last part of, uh, of, my, uh, of this course. So to what extent the blockchain uh, technology can uh, uh, transform the governance uh, you know, structure? Um, of course, I think uh, here there are two different types of basically, I think somebody asked the question about DAO. So DAO is, I would say it's uh, at least conceptually is a uh, contrasting or opposite the kind of you know, uh, idea mm -hmm. about uh, uh, how to organize certain kind of, uh, you know, how an organization can be formed. So of course, currently we have, you know, more centralized you know, hierarchical structures, that is the corporations, traditional corporations. Then we have new, maybe we have new type of, you know, uh, 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 organizations that is that. Again, as I said, we need to, before say they are actually, you know, contract, you know, in contrast to each other, we need to have a deeper look into that, what exactly it is and how they are, uh, I think uh, DAOs are all different. You know, again, we cannot answer this question in abstract. But uh, whether you know the traditional uh, corporate will be transformed to a more like decentralized like DAO structure, this again I think is pretty much uh, based on the competition from the very beginning of this course. I talked about the competition of the various sources of trust, and if we do have these two opposite type of you know. Uh, uh, organizations, centralized versus decentralized. Again, I think uh, competition probably will determine who ultimately will carry the day. I think probably there will be some uh, equilibrium in between. Neither, you know, uh, this completely this side or the other side, but there will be some mixture and they will uh, affect each other. This, I think, is a very interesting question. Uh, but as I said, uh, uh, to answer that question in a more meaningful, sensible way we need to have a deeper look at what the DAO is, what it can achieve currently. Uh, that actually, I think, uh, based on will be, you know, will require many kind of empirical works. I think for good or for worse, the blockchain has some more, you know, kind of uh, uh, transparency to some extent, and uh, hopefully that will uh, facilitate that kind of very important research. Do you foresee Bitcoin or other uh, crypto for becoming mainstream currency alongside the fiat in the near future. I don't foresee Bitcoin uh, as a, a mainstream car currency alongside the fiat in the near future. That's something um, I have always, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I have always had this idea. I don't think Bitcoin in particular. If you ask me about other kind of crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies, especially uh, stable coins. Uh, may or may not. It uh, really, you know, depends on how uh, reliable, or trustworthy, uh, you know, these kind of stable coins uh, will be. Uh, and in that regard, actually, our course will pretty, you know, kind of uh, in more details to explore various types of, uh, uh, you know, stable coins, and to see what kind of stable coins probably is more likely uh, to play some role of fiat currencies uh, in, in the near future. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think I answered all these questions. And again, thank you very much for um, your you know, participation. And I hope you will like uh, uh, this, you know, the things I share with you. And I'm happy to uh, you know, uh, interact or exchange with you further if you, uh, you know, uh, 
choose to come to our school and to our ARM program in particular. This year, we will have a ARM program devoted to these issues, blockchain, one of which is the blockchain. Uh, the new track is called Law and Technology, apart from uh, blockchain. In that track, you will see uh, such important technology issues such as, you know, the AI, the, uh, you know, the data privacy, data uh, uh, cross-border transformation, as well as uh, uh, FinTech regulations. So, okay, thank you very much and hope to see you uh, again sometime uh, in the near future. Okay, thank you, Proof. Uh, can you see my screen or hear me voice? Yes. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Prof. John's master class. I think it's very interesting uh, because I'm so happy to see some students ask uh, questions about the metaverse and the digital currency. Uh, I should uh, I should say uh, the master class is very similar to our real class, and you can talk about or discuss the latest uh, cases or issues with our professors. So uh, you can feel our SMU class is different from other schools. It's a seminar style and you can uh, discuss anything with our professors. And it's not just a teaching or listening. It's just like an interactive environment. So uh, next part is the information section about Yangpang High School Law uh, postgraduate programs is about GD and the masters in laws. So uh, as a beginning, I uh, introduce myself. My name is Gong Jinhao. You can call me Aaron. Uh, I'm the marketing and recruitment manager in SMU Yangpang High School Law. So uh, today uh, I will basically uh, introduce our school, our GD and the LLM program, then the most important the application precise. So if you have any questions, you can uh, tap your questions in the QA session, or you can send us email uh, at the end of the, the, the event. Okay. So uh, when we talk about SMU Young Pang Hao School Law, I think four advantages will be beneficial to your future SMU life. Uh, first is a city campus. Uh, I guess most of you are local students, so uh, you will be very familiar with SMU campus. Uh, it's located in the center of Singapore, very, very near to the heart of business, finance, and law industry. I think it's very important for our uh, law students. Uh, obviously, it will save your time and provide more opportunities for work and your social life. The second one is international faculty. About half of our faculties are from US and UK famous law schools, such as uh, Harvard, Stanford, Cambridge. It means you can touch cutting edge law related issues around the world. You will use latest real cases as your learning materials in our class. So, uh, uh, if you are enrolled in our program, you will find your learning materials will be a little different from your uh, other, uh, other students because each semester our professors or instructors will update their teaching materials. The third point is uh, leading resources. Uh, we have several leading research centers in Yangpang High School Law, and we have uh, new teaching facilities, teaching buildings. Uh, it's very modern facilities. If possible, you may con uh, conduct a, uh, projects with our faculties to enhance your uh, practical experience. Finally, the leading approach. I think SMU class is very is, is very smaller. Uh, in a seminar style, maybe just uh, 30 to 45 students in each class. So it will guarantee you uh, an interactive environment. And your classmates with diversity background will open your mind at the same time. Actually, following the faster developing world, our programs 
do not only develop uh, tell you the law stories, it's interdisciplinary. So that means you will be able to know how to contact uh, law and other industry together in the future. So let's talk about our GD and the LLM program. Our GD program is not a master degree, not a PhD degree, it's just a, a basic law degree. Uh, so uh, it's a three-year full-time postgraduate program. Our GD class, class is, uh, uh, is, is on exclusive basis. You don't need to sit together with other LLB students. Your classmates are only GD candidates. I think this point is very different from other universities. So if your final GPA is three or more than three at the time of graduation, congratulations, you are eligible to sit for the Singapore bar exam. Most important, after three years training, you not only get knowledge of law, but also forge the critical thinking, professional judgments, and improve your presentation skills. Uh, during the GDLL, uh, GD program, uh, you have many choices, such as you can uh, complete uh, SMU MBA degree at the same time, or Yonsei GD dual degree program, or Bokini LLM program. So uh, these three choices, you can find more detailed information on our official website. I don't extend too much in our information session. So you just remember after you, you enrolled by our GD program, you can have more choices. Uh, this is our program structure. It includes the core modules, electives, six week internship and 20 hours public service. I think after the 2022, the internship has uh, some update. Uh, I remember is not six weeks, uh, maybe, uh, oh, I forgot, but it's updated. So you see in our uh, program structure, we totally have 25 credit units, uh, but for the core course and elective course, we will have slightly changes. For 2022, the core course will be 17 credit units. For the electives, it will have eight credit units. You will find our updated uh, information on our official website. Okay, for the LLM program, it's an advanced law degree, it's master degree. La. You can complete in a one year full-time or two year part-time. But let me make more class uh, classification about the difference between full-time and part-time. I think our part-time is a little different from your imagination. For example, if you are enrolled by LLM in August 2022 and you choose full-time, then you will complete all required courses by April, 2020, uh, April 2023 in two semesters. Each semester, you will have four courses. If you choose part-time, you will first complete term one and term two by April 2023, then start your term three and four from 2020, uh, August 2023 to April 2024. But most of our part-time courses are arranged in the daytime. Mm, we have almost no evening classes. Mm, it will depend on our instructors. So it means if you are still working, you choose part-time, maybe you should ask for leave during your working time. So the LLM master degree doesn't qualify you for the admission to Singapore bar exam, uh, doesn't like the GD program, but you can be a registered foreign lawyers, in-house lawyers, or working overseas. Uh, uh, it's about your future career. Our LLM training uh, will enhance your professional knowledge, 
critical thinking and the communication. I think it's a common advantage for all SMU courses. For our LLM program, you have several choices. We currently, we have three tracks. The first one is judicial study. The judicial study is uh, in partnership with Singapore Judicial College, colleague designed especially for sitting judges and the judicial uh, aspirants. It's not only academic training or academic education, but also good practical chances to understand the real law industry. Because some famous judges and lawyers will be invited into our class. So if you are interested in this track and want to apply, you must have a law degree, first degree in law, and rich working experience. And the second track is cross-border business and finance law in Asia. From the name you will know, in addition to law, it will equip you with business and financial uh, knowledge, especially for uh, cross-border data transaction, financial regulation, international business and uh, investment and so on. So uh, if you search our website, you will see another track, the dual LLM in Singapore and London. Uh, you can also uh, choose this track to replace the cross-border track, but the dual LLM track will uh, be postponed to next January. Yeah, the next intake is uh, January, 2023. So you can, uh, if you are interested, in dual LLM, you can find the uh, detailed information on our web website. The final track is law and technology. I think uh, you have listened to Prof. John's master class. Uh, it's about the new track. So uh, today, the new technology are developing very fast, such as AI blockchain and the metaverse you just mentioned. They will. Uh, when apply new technologies into business, they will meet many legal problems. So we launched this new track and hope you are interested in it. Oh, this is our LLM program structure. Uh, we will still slightly uh, adjust the courses according to the ability of our instructors uh, every year. So uh, I think this year, just a little change you can reference to our, uh, refer to our website. Okay, the most important part is uh, application uh, precise. Uh, I think the GD program and the LLM programs application process is very similar. So I just uh, take GD program as an example. Uh, each applicant will go over these five steps of application. Uh, the application is on a rolling basis. Our admission committee will consider each application case by case. Uh, some students are afraid that their undergraduate university is not very good or their CV is not competitive. They are curious if they are eligible or not. Uh, I should clarify that our selection will assess all your supporting documents, not rely on any single items. Uh, for example, maybe your, um, your one of your supporting documents is not so competitive. Don't worry, we will consider all of them as a whole. So we will not reject you by a single document. The first, you are eligible or not. For the GD program, uh, doesn't require a law background. But if you are a law graduate, you should graduate for a civil law country or a non-gathered uh, common law university. If you, uh, all applicants should get uh, at least a second class upper degree. I know some countries may not have the degree classification such as in China, don't worry. You can indicate average scores, rankings, or uh, something else to us and we will help you to uh, assess. Uh, if you have no second class upper degree, 
but a uh, reaching uh, but a uh, rich working experience uh, don't hesitate to submit your application because I think the rich working experience will be very helpful for your discussion during your class. Uh, if undergraduate education was not conducted in English, you should have a valid English proficiency test score, such as IELTS and TOEFL. Uh, in general, the, uh, the score will be val valid in two years from the test date. Then the online application. The online application for Yangpang High School Law is very simple. It's just need some basic personal information. Uh, if I'm not wrong, just some ID information, uh, on your names, genders, just like this. So uh, except for this, no other supporting documents needs to, to be submitted here. Uh, remember, you should pay your application fee, then we can push forward the application process. Uh, when you apply online, please remember, don't just save your application. You should click the submit button because each year we have students just save their application in the system, but we can't see it uh, unless you click the submit button, okay? Then the supporting documents. I list all supporting documents here and it should be English version. Please pay attention to recommendation forms. Recommendation forms. Some students just send us the recommendation letter, but uh, okay, the letter is helpful and meaningful, but we are really need is a form. You can download the form from this link, uh, from, from this link. I think the structure form will save you and your referees a lot of time. Then please uh, place and label all supporting documents in a Google Drive and share the folder link with editor exercise to my colleagues. No need hard copies before you accept our offers. Please don't email supporting documents to us by email directly because uh, your supporting documents size is very large. It will go to the spam uh, uh, emails directly. Uh, if you have no access to Google, uh, you can send us email first, then we will help you. Then the written test and the interview. All applicants should take the written test and the interview. Uh, about the written test, I should say we have no sample paper. You don't, um, don't need the legal uh, knowledge, it's, it's not required. Uh, it's just like a reading comprehension, a long article. Following the article, there are four of uh, three to five questions, and you should answer these questions in one hour. Uh, and the writing test is where Zoom. Uh, some students send us email, they are worried about the writing test. I think I should tell you, if you are good in uh, reading comprehension, if you have some uh, uh, prepare well, uh, I think no, uh, no need to worry too much about the writing test. So you just uh, need to know how to handle this one hour. The, the time is very limited to finish the writing test. Uh, the, our program office uh, will send you the test invitation after receive all necessary documents and you can choose your preferred test date. The test and the interview will wear Zoom uh, during the special period. Uh, if you graduate from SMU LLM, it means you are LLM alumni in past three years and obtained a 3.4 GPA, Congratulations, you don't need the written test or interview, just waiting for our offer. Uh, so it means you just uh, join our online application, submit supporting documents, and then get offer. Uh, final uh, is uh, 
you get the offer. After you accept our offer, you should pay the registration fee depending on your identification. If you are PR Singaporeans or foreign students, and another five thousand as a reservation fee. If you are SMU alumni, uh, graduate within five years, uh, I think you will get ten percent. 10, uh, 10 percent discount on tuition fee uh, if you are SMU alumni graduate in past three years and completed five law courses uh, you will be exempted up to five credit units from the total 25 credit units final the tuition fee I think the um, tuition fee is a little expensive uh, seven uh, 73 about 70. Uh, 4,000. Uh, we have no government subsidies and you should pay in four installments over the first two years. And please pay attention to the scholarship. Uh, most of scholarship will depend on your exam result. It means the GPA of your uh, first year, at the end of your first year, uh, we will grant the scholarship and the program award to the top students. Okay, for the LLM program, I just uh, show you some difference. Uh, first one is uh, for juridical study tracks, I just mentioned you must have bachelor degree in law and working experience. But for other tracks, uh, we have non-law students are welcome. But if you are non-law students, you should have law-related working experience. What is law-related working experience? It doesn't mean you must work in law industry or law firm. It may be the, um, such as uh, the, the accountancy, complaints, regulation, contracts, and the law uh, enforcement, and so on. So uh, it's, very, uh, it's a very broad uh, uh, concept. Uh, it doesn't mean you should work in a law firm. So uh, if you are a non-law student and don't know if you are eligible, don't worry. Please include your working details as much as possible in your personal statement on your CV, what you feel related to law our committee will evaluate them. Uh, if your undergraduate university is from uh, this list here, from this list, uh, and your course are conducted in English, the English proficiency test score is not need, uh, needed. If you are from uh, countries outside the list, you will need the English proficiency test score. Second, the supporting documents. For the LLM program, you can uh, submit supporting documents by emails directly and mail the hard copies to our office. You can find our address from this link. Uh, this is different from GD program. GD program, you should share the Google folder, but for the LLM program, you just uh, email us directly and mail the hard copies to our office. Then for the dual LLM program, uh, you don't need to apply uh, the program directly by SMU. You should submit your application to Green Mary University of London directly. Uh, you can find our, the, their link in uh, our website. Uh, when you are shortlisted by Queen Mary University of London, you can proceed to SMU application stage and should also join our online application and written test and interview. Then finally, the uh, tuition fee, the same, we have no government subsidies. Uh, SMU alumni will have 10% discount and you should pay the tuition fee in two installments over the first, uh, in, uh, no, no, it's wrong, not the first one year, the first year. <clears throat> and you can see the scholarship, I think, most, uh, most of our LLM programs scholarship are for 
during the study track. But good news, uh, for the law and technology track, we have a founder LLM in law and technology scholarship. Uh, is twenty thousand Singapore dollar. You see, our tuition fee is just a. Uh, 37,000 and the scholarship will be very attractive. Uh, but the scholarship will depend on your final GPA. Okay, so this is all content for the information session today. I think you must have some more questions about our program or the application process, uh, you can search our official website or send us e email. I will reply to you very, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, uh, maybe in one day or uh, two days. Uh, so normally, generally, we will reply to you in one day. So the final point I want to mention is our uh, deadline because it's not February, the mid February. The deadline for application for LLM program will be the uh, early May, and the GD program deadline will be April 17. So if you haven't submitted your application online, please uh, submit as soon as possible. I guess some students haven't prepared all doc supporting document. It doesn't need to wait you prepare well. You can submit, uh, for example, you didn't get your English proficiency test score right now. Doesn't matter. You can submit other supporting documents first. Then uh, you can send the other documents separately to our email. Uh, you can scan the QR code to search related information on our website. Uh, that's all. And do you have any questions? If you have some questions about the application, you can type your questions in QA session. Okay, uh, if you have more questions, you can send us uh, email. Uh, and I think we have no questions right now and I will hand over to Evan. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for the sessions um, for the masterclass as well as the information session on our Juris Doctor program as well as our Master of Laws. And uh, we just want to kind of bring to you uh, the opportunity to find out a little bit more about the suite of our SMU postgraduate programs. And um, that's uh, our SMU Master's Day is actually happening this weekend at it's all the way till the 24th of February, actually. Um, so uh, this is an opportunity for you to sign up for it. Um, just go to smu.sg slash master's day, and uh, you'll be able to register for over 21 different talks and as well as webinars uh, that will be happening live. You will also be able to chat one-on-one -on -one, uh, with our admissions advisors and attend a whole um, suite of of program information sessions as well. So the QR code is there for you to uh, register and uh, join us at this event. There will also be an opportunity for you to uh, attend some physical classes that we are conducting um, on Sunday, the 20th of February. 
So this is held in conjunction with the ESMU Open House on campus. So um, it's going to be a great chance for you to be able to visit us. Again, uh, we'd like to invite all of you to join us for Master's Day uh, on um, the 19th to the 24th of February. And most of the sessions are going to be online. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time today, uh, attending the session uh, from the Young Makao School of Law, uh, listening to our master classes as well as our information sessions. And again, if there are any uh, more queries or questions that you have, feel free to contact us. With that, I'd like to pass it back to Tabby. Thank you, Ivan, Aaron, and Prof Zhang for being with us today. I hope you've enjoyed today's session and we'll now invite you to participate in our feedback poll. Please give us your honest feedback so that we can further improve on our master's experience series. The feedback poll should be popping up on your screen, so please take a few moments to share with us your observations. Just a couple more seconds. Thank you very much for your feedback and for joining us today. This Master's Experience Series is proudly brought to you by Headhunt in partnership with Yongpang House School, of Law SMU. Please join us this Friday, 18th of February, on the topic of building a native Android application presented by Institute of System Science and US. Please sign up early on our website, postgrad.sg. With that, we will end today's session. We wish you a wonderful day ahead. See you on Friday. Bye. <laughs>